There are seven steps to our culture transformation process. The first one is to make sure that the CEO and the senior team support the transformation process. They need to understand what the process involves, what model for organizational development, and how it's relevant to today's trends, and what's required of them and the entire staff in terms of time, money, and participation. The next step is to make sure that the organization is benchmarking and measuring things around the culture like trust, alignment, and engagement so that the areas needing priority attention are clearly identified and you can then track progress on these as they're remeasured periodically. The third step is getting the senior team on the bus with a particular process and plan that works with everyone and starting with them. Here are some of the subparts to this step. First, the senior team must believe in people and have made a commitment to building a high level of trust in their teams and with all employees, including their team managers and leaders, in order to help them build it too in a trickle-down manner. The senior team has to believe that the people are important, that the relationships are important, that the communications between them matter, and that their business is not just about profit, but rather about people and purpose first. And that they understand that one of the keys to building trust and personal responsibility is having a values-based culture that is purpose-driven. So values are going to be a big part of the culture and will be captured in the organization's blueprint, and everyone will be highly aware of them and the entire senior team must be committed to the organization's purpose, values, visions, and for creating a responsibility-based culture. Most organizations sort of go into business somewhat randomly, and they focus a lot on goals and procedures and roles, but they don't spend as much time as is needed on purpose, values, and visions. So that's where we're going to start the process. The senior team also adopts a values-based strategy to transform the culture and the operations within it. So part of that strategy is the role of mentoring, the role of assessment, how you train people, how you hire and onboard them, and how you integrate new standardized expectations for professional behaviors and how you make them distributive to everyone in the organization from CEO to frontline staff. The fourth step is to ensure that the managers and supervisors are building trust and that they're creating an environment, in other words, they're creating conditions and conversations that build up the four core needs and where people are being self-directed. This is important because part of what you're going to be doing as an organization is mentoring everyone every month so that your people grow in honor, in dignity, and respect. And you're going to be using the blueprint as part of that process for communicating ownership of each person's lives and how they share that with one another. Everyone gets mentored. So that's the support that's needed structurally from the managers and supervisors. And you grow to understand more and more why the mentoring matters and what it's designed to do and how it's not designed to be checking up on people, but rather it's designed to support people and then help them back to the tools, that kind of thing. You want to make sure that they all have the emotional intelligence skills, which remember are self-awareness, self-management, awareness of others, and managing relationships. And that's where all these tools come in. And many of them you haven't even learned yet. There are more than 30 of these tools that are part of emotional and social intelligence. You want the managers and supervisors to develop their coaching and counseling skills. I would also add these are more like a structure of Socratic questions combined with encouragement and presence as opposed to advice giving from above. So they can talk with their team members about their relationships and performance. And that even includes reverse mentoring where maybe a manager mentors an employee and the employee turns back around and, and mentors that manager. So it's really important that the managers and supervisors make sure that all the staff are and feel included and that everyone sees the meaningfulness of the work that they're doing and that all their contributions matter. In that way, everything becomes purpose-based instead of just activity-driven. So managers and supervisors must develop their team members so that each person can take the ownership that they need to take for continually improving their own performance. So the areas that we like to say are most important is that people improve the quality of their relationships with each other, how productive they are, and the level of engagement, like how high is your engagement level? How happy are you to show up for work? 
Each one of those is its own separate area. And you want to make sure that people are on track. It's like keeping an eye on your vital signs to make sure that everything's in tip top shape because all of those vital signs work together for really stellar individual and group success. So relationships, productivity, engagement, blueprint, they're all part of a larger system. And much of this is tracked and communicated in the blueprint. Everyone needs to know how to do this. And the senior team and all the managers and supervisors are modeling the systems first. Next, you create a value-based culture where everybody in the organization understands the values and those values are integrated into the operations of the business. And that even includes how you hire and onboard people. It's very different than a conventional culture. Everyone understands from day one the kind of culture that you have because even your hiring practices reflect that everyone is supporting the culture. You'll be considering your candidates first for their fit into your culture. Do they know what you expect of them? Zappos is an example of a company that I use in this lesson. They put their people through a four-week orientation on culture. First of all, they have a very comprehensive screening of their candidates, including observations by their tram drivers who take the candidates on a tour and they record how respectful they are or are not. So you'll see a little video on some of that coming up. Then after the first week of their orientation, Zappos would say to the new candidates, if you want to leave, we'll pay you $1,000 and say goodbye on good terms. And at the end of two weeks, they offer $2,000 to leave on good terms. They do this because they want people who don't think that culture is for them to make their way out of that culture because their culture is their primo priority that they're focused on. CEO Tony Shea would often say, we know that if we don't get the culture right, nothing's going to work right. And so that's what it means to create a culture that's values-based and in which you make sure that you're making operational those values in every level and every system. The question for the leaders are, how do we keep these values and this purpose front and center at all times as an expectation of our leadership? The next step is you make opportunities so that all staff can learn how to operate in cross-functional teams. Remember when I shared that the four stages of healthy community are pseudo community and then chaos and then empty and then healthy community? In this step, Everyone has plenty of opportunities within the culture activities and within the operations of the business to gain and demonstrate mastery and moving out of pseudo community and chaos and remaining in empty and true community where the real magic happens. It's only then when people are truly expanded, dynamic, agile, and consistently intentional enough to be effective and cross-functioning spontaneously and even when in uncharted territory. When you have that in place, then people can do all kinds of cool problem solving together. Wisdom and camaraderie and collaboration abound. Until you have that happening more often than not, and with most of your people most of the time, as opposed to Gallup's minority of people, you won't be able to successfully use cross-functional teams to redesign systems, processes, and structures, not only related to your culture, but to all the systems of the business and the agility of your business. And the reason this is important is that all of your people have frontline experiences. They have unique gifts and unique perspectives, and they're eager and need to contribute. These are only possible when you have high emotional intelligence and high levels of self-governance and relationship management. A final word on benchmarking. You want to regularly measure progress so that you have your hand on the pulse of things. And when I say measuring, I mean specific things. Like let's say you want to get and maintain a certain retention rate or reduce gossip by a certain amount of incidents. This requires that you know what data you have to collect as a starting point and what and when to measure progress along the way. For example, in the case of the reduction of gossip, one of my clients started collecting how many times something was resolved instead of gossiped about and worked to increase that number. Our job is to help you recognize how your organization's doing on fulfilling the eight values that build trust. In other words, if your trust gap is shrinking, if your engagement and alignment is expanding, and we do this by periodically remeasuring. When you benchmark, it doesn't mean that you have to benchmark everything, but it does mean that you set a couple of specific outcomes that you want that, if accomplished, means a lot of other things would have to be happening too. 
Purpose, values, and visions focus on the future, where we're going. That's why this is a top priority for the senior team. Goals, procedures, and roles are focused on how you're going to get there today. There's a strong correlation, 77%, between focus on the future and focus on the present. So what that means is people who are more strongly aligned with your organization's purpose and their values and their visions will be more aligned and more committed to their goals, procedures, and roles. Now, why is that? Why do you think it's so? It's because it's purpose-based. In motivation terms, because one knows why we're doing things, we're motivated. In fact, a sense of meaningfulness is the most important priority for being self-motivated from the inside out. People also feel more secure when they know what behaviors are expected of them and they feel they can fulfill on those behaviors. They like to have the pictures of what's being targeted for visions so that the picture of that inspires them too. If you do set up strong alignment for your future, everyone will be more likely to be committed to your present and then positive momentum is set in motion. So this would be like you're building the house and you say, we want to build this house in this way because we want to use it for amazing parties and gatherings that are meaningful for the family and the neighborhood. So we designed it so it's going to have this lovely open format and everyone's going to be able to communicate with each other. And we want to show up with these values of hospitality and graciousness. And we envision that in the next three years, we're going to have several baby showers and a wedding and graduation parties and workshops all here. And all of a sudden, you've painted this picture where everyone wants to come to this and support the building of it. It's totally different than if you just said, okay, everybody, let's just get our chainsaws out and get started. So the future focus is what creates the positive momentum. So these are the values that Zappos has. Not only was it their purpose to deliver wow through service, it was one of their values as well. So it was both a noun and a verb. This is what we want to do and how we want to behave to cause a wow experience, really great and delightful surprises through service. Create fun and a little weirdness. For example, they have a policy that you can openly cuss in their environment. And there are a lot of other things some companies would consider weird. You've got to read the book about their culture called Delivering Happiness. Be humble. And we, our offices are located in Las Vegas, and we actually offer tours to the public. So uh, anytime any, anyone in the audience is going to Vegas, you can sign up for a tour, pick you up from the airport in Zappa shuttle, give you a tour, which takes about an hour, and then drop you off at your hotel afterwards. So we do the exact same thing for our candidates visiting from out of town. They'll get the tour, and then they'll spend the rest of the day interviewing. Well, at the end of the day of interviews, the recruiter will circle back to the shuttle driver and ask how he or she was treated. And it doesn't matter how well the day of interviews went, if the shuttle driver wasn't treated well, we won't hire that person. And the reverse is true too, we'll fire people, uh, even if they're a superstar, if they're not living up to the core values. And does that happen very often? Well, we try to, it's a lot easier if you catch it on the front end. And so it doesn't, it, it doesn't happen as often because we're so, we actually separate the, uh, the hiring decisions. So there's a hiring manager that interviews for kind of the standard stuff, experience, technical ability, and so on. And then our HR department interviews for core values and culture fit. And they have to pass both in order to be hired. Values are how you operate. Standards that you commit to. How are you going to handle power? What are our beliefs about governance? What are our priorities? What kind of motivation do we want to foster? And what psychology will we adopt? This is about understanding that to build trust and personal responsibility, you need a values-based culture.